Thank you. Awesome. Thank you very much. Is audio good on this microphone for the folks in the audience? All right. Very good. Good morning, everyone. Um, I hope everyone had a uh, fantastic first day of the conference yesterday, and uh, we've got two more uh, uh, great days ahead of us. And uh, so, w once again, thank you for, uh, for coming this morning. Um, wh what I'm going to talk, uh, spend a little bit of time talking about is I'm going to talk a little bit about Micronaut and uh, some history related to uh, what led us to build Micronaut and uh, talk a little bit about how some of that history affected uh, some of the design decisions or uh, sort of goals that we had for the framework that we satisfied. And uh, I want to talk about that history in, in the, um, uh, with the, uh, the idea of, of focusing on this, uh, this idea of I identify, innovate, and iterate. And we'll see that the history of Grails and Micronaut have gone through uh, uh, several uh, iterations of that. And uh, we'll point out, I'll point out several of those as we move along. Um, just really quickly, my name is Jeff Brown. I'm a partner at Object Computing. Um, Object Computing is a, uh, we're a global company. We've got folks all over the place, um, including here in Europe um, and Australia and all over the U.S. Um, but we're headquartered in St. Louis, Missouri, which is where I happen to live. Um, but we are a distributed company. Um, I am the um, Grails and Micronaut practice lead, so I help manage the teams that uh, create and support uh, this, uh, this technology. And uh, I've co-authored a couple of the Grails books for A-Press, and you see some contact information up there. I'm, uh, I'm pretty easy to track down if you need anything. And speaking of that, uh, if, if you need anything at all this week uh, while I'm here, uh, please come by the object computing table and uh, visit any of us. If, uh, uh, if you have questions or comments about Grails, Micronaut, Groovy, uh, any of the stuff that we do at object computing, please come by and see us, and we, we would be happy to talk to you and get you uh, whatever it is that we can to, uh, to help you out. So let's, uh, let's press on. So I want to talk about this idea of uh, identify, innovate, and iterate, uh, specifically in the context of uh, Micronaut and, uh, and Grails. And to start that discussion, I'm going to talk a little bit about um, uh, history that led us to where we are today. So the Grails framework, how many of you have done anything with the Grails framework? Uh, pretty much everyone in the room, fantastic. You've come to the right place. Um, so the, the, how many of you have worked with uh, Grails 2? Everyone in the room. Uh, Grails 1. Pre-Grails 1. Uh, I see, I know that you did for sure. Uh, yep, so I see maybe five, six, seven hands. That's awesome. Um, so Grails 1 has been around for, or Grails has been around for, uh, for quite a while. Um, we released Grails 1.0 in February of 2008. So that was uh, more than 11 years ago. And the framework predates 1.0 um, by more than a year. So the, the, the framework is, uh, depending on what you call day one, is, is 11 or 12 years old. It's well over a decade old. It's been around for a long time. Um, around the time that uh, we started creating the Grails framework, um, so call it, uh, say, 2007, um, around that time, there were a lot of JVM web frameworks trying to emerge ar around the same time. And the, uh, a significant reason for that was that or at that time, kind of the state of the art for building JVM web apps would have been, um, Struts 1 was certainly one of the big players at the time. And Struts was a really great improvement over what existed before Struts. So if you were writing servlets and implementing do get and do put yourself, uh, that's, uh, that's a pretty tedious way to build, uh, build web applications. I see some people nodding and laughing. Uh, I think you're, you're remembering some pain from back then. Um, so Struts was an improvement over what predated it, um, but it was obvious there had to be a better way. Uh, Struts didn't cover a whole lot of ground. It was quite tedious to do simple things. You had to write numerous components to, to do, do things like simple, uh, simple web forms. Um, so it was an improvement over what uh, existed before uh, Struts came along, but it was obvious there had to be a better way. And it was so obvious that lots of folks recognized that, and lots of folks were trying to build JVM web frameworks around the same time. So much so that when we very first started work on uh, the Grails framework, when I started talking to people, well before we got to 1.0, uh, when, I, when I first started talking to people about the fact that we were building a JVM web framework, uh, a common question was, do we really need another one of those things? Uh, there's so many of them emerging, uh, because there were so many emerging at the time, um, entering into that space 
uh, to some folks, seemed uh, may maybe a, a dubious decision. Do we, do we really need another, another JVM web framework? And we didn't want to build just another JVM web framework. Uh, I think Grails has been tremendously successful at helping to redefine how those kinds of applications are built. The framework has been successful for, uh, for over a decade. Most of those frameworks that I mentioned that were all trying to emerge around the same time, most of them never got any traction, never had any success, you never heard their names. Uh, but some of them did have um, uh, varying levels of success. Some had uh, some short-lived success, some had some longer-lived success, but not many of those frameworks had the kind of staying power and longevity that the Grails framework has had. We, we've still got a, um, a growing business around the technology, very successful business. We've still got, we've got a, a, a very active roadmap. We're about to release Grails 4. Um, hopefully some of you saw Sergio's talk yesterday about what's new in Grails 4. We've got really, really exciting stuff in Grails 4 and more stuff on the horizon coming. Uh, Grails is still very much uh, alive and an important part of, uh, of our industry and continues to be uh, uh, successful. Um, uh, and as I said, not many of those frameworks that were trying to emerge around the time had that, that kind of longevity, and that, that's fantastic. Uh, we're very proud of that. Um, and an important part of the framework's longevity has been evolution. Uh, the framework has changed a lot over the last decade or so. Grails 3, which is the latest version of Grails for the moment, until we release Grails 4 in a few weeks. Um, Grails 3 is very different than Grails 1 was. Um, uh, a lot, and uh, so the reason for that is a lot has changed in the last decade around how people want to build um, a JVM web applications. So one example of that is REST. So certainly 10 years ago, the idea of REST existed, and people did in fact build REST services, and people built REST services with Grails and had success with that. But REST was nowhere near as big of a deal uh, a decade ago as it is today. Today, every enterprise publishes REST services. Because REST really wasn't an important part of the industry and an important part of how we built applications a decade ago, the software we were building a decade ago didn't prioritize building those kinds of apps. And there weren't a whole lot of capabilities in the framework specifically for building those kinds of apps. You could definitely build REST APIs. As I said, we, 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 uh, lots of people did that with, uh, with Grails 1 and even before Grails 1. But if you were building sophisticated REST APIs with really early versions of Grails, you might have had to have uh, built some of the tedious bits yourself. So you might have had to write some custom data binding stuff or maybe some custom data validation, uh, custom JSON marshalling and unmarshalling stuff because there was not a whole lot of capability in the framework uh, for simplifying building those kinds of applications. And then over the years, as REST became more and more important, the framework stayed ahead of that by implementing more and more features related to building REST services. Um, and today we've got terrific support for REST inside uh, the Grails framework. So that's an example of the technology evolving over the years to adapt to the way that folks want to build applications today. And that's been an important part of the, the framework's um, longevity and continued success. Um, another example of that is GORM. GORM is the ORM tool that is, uh, is part of Grails. It's, it's been part of Grails since the very, very beginning uh, of Grails. And uh, in, in recent years, we've, uh, we've made some changes to GORM to make it very, very easy to use GORM outside of Grails. So today you can use GORM in Grails. It's, it's there and configured by default. It's very easy to use GORM um, in, uh, outside of Grails. You can use GORM in a Spring Boot app. You can definitely use GORM in a Micronaut app. You can use GORM really in any JVM app. That, that's very easy to do uh, with recent versions of GORM. Um, but in the beginning, GORM was, was part of the Grails framework. And it was originally conceived to be a layer on top of Hibernate. Hibernate is the de facto standard ORM tool for the JVM. And one of the sort of sets of goals that we had for GORM from the very beginning is it, it was really designed and conceived to be a layer on top of Hibernate. We wanted to make it easier to take advantage of all the stuff that Hibernate has to offer. And we wanted to add additional capabilities on top of what Hibernate had to offer. And in short, that, that's what GORM was uh, initially, and it was uh, uh, great at, at doing that. We satisfied those goals. Um, for the first year or so of GORM's existence, one of the most highly voted feature requests for GORM was JPA. People wanted to pull Hibernate out and plug in Toplink or some other JPA implementation. 
So uh, we recognized that and refactored GORM and created a JPA implementation. So at that point, you could use GORM with Hibernate or you could use GORM with JPA. People like that. Uh, and then fast forward a few years uh, past that, and some of the so-called NoSQL databases started gaining traction and gaining momentum. Databases like MongoDB and Cassandra, and there were a lot of non-SQL non databases emerging and gaining traction and, and attention around the same time. As that was happening, um, folks started asking for support for using GORM to talk to those kinds of databases. So we refactored GORM even, even further. Um, not only did we decouple it from Hibernate, we really decoupled it from the idea of a relational database. Um, and today we've got implementations of GORM for Hibernate and JPA and MongoDB and Neo4j, which is a really interesting graph database, uh, Cassandra. We've got a lot of implementations of GORM for different kinds of data stores. And that's another example of the technology evolving over the years to uh, adapt to the way that people want to build applications today. Still today, most people using GORM are using Hibernate. Uh, by far, that, that's the most popular GORM implementation. But for folks who want to not use a relational database, you might want to use Mongo or Neo4j, there are really comp compelling reasons why you might want to use GORM for talking to those databases. So it's great that we've got support for, um, for doing that. So that's another example, just like REST, that's an example of the technology evolving over the years and changing to adapt to the way that people want to build, uh, build applications today. So that's an those are both examples of uh, this identify, innovate, and iterate uh, pattern. So we identified uh, a problem, right? So there's got to be a better way than struts. Um, so uh, we built a new technology to address that challenge. And, uh, and that was successful, and then we iterate, right? And the same thing with GORM. Uh, we wanted to make Hibernate easier to use and add a bunch of capabilities to Hibernate. Uh, so we identified that, uh, that opportunity or that gap and then created new technology to address that. And uh, that's been an important part of uh, the, the framework success over the years is that identifying a gap, uh, addressing that with innovation, and then rinse and repeat, do more of the same, and that's what we've been doing for, uh, for a long time. So Gorm, there are other examples of uh, pieces of, of Grails that have, that have evolved over the years, but I'll, I'll leave it at, at, with, at just those two. So REST and GORM. We've got two different examples there that I've, that I've summarized of uh, uh, things that, relate, that were very different a decade ago than they are today, right? So REST was not uh, terribly important a decade ago, it is today, and the framework uh, kept up with that all along the way. GORM has adapted over the years. So as, um, as we're confronted with uh, the changing landscape, uh, we have to make decisions about what to do to address whatever it is that's changing in the landscape. Um, so for REST, we added more REST support. For GORM, we added support for new kinds of databases. Another one of those challenges or, or changes that emerged in recent years that, uh, that we had to confront and make some decisions about were challenges associated with microservices, right? Microservices, just like REST wasn't a big deal a decade ago, microservices were not a giant deal a decade ago. People built what we would call microservices today um, a decade ago, but microservices were not nearly as important in 2007 as they are in, in 2019. So recognizing that microservice architectures are an important part of our industry and uh, so, so recognizing that, we wanted to have really, really great support for building those kinds of applications. So w we had to look at our, our current technology and make some decisions about how to confront the growing demand for building microservice architectures. So one issue with um, our current technology at the time, so Grails in particular, one issue with Grails and building microservices uh, uh, with, with the framework is Grails was really not designed for building microservices. Um, it was designed at a time when microservices were not, uh, not terribly important. You can definitely build microservices with Grails. We've done tons of that. We've had lots of success with that. No one is saying you can't build microservices with Grails. You can build microservices with Grails, and we've done lots of that. But the framework was really not designed for building those kinds of systems. And because of that, when you're building those kinds of systems with Grails, when you're building microservice architectures uh, with, or building microservices with Grails, compromises are being made. And uh, we'll, we'll talk about some of those as we press along. Um, 
But uh, some of that, to, to sort of start down that road, some of those compromises have to do with the relationship between Grails and the Spring framework. So Grails is built on top of Spring. Grails has always been built on top of Spring since the very, very beginning. Grails has, has been built on Spring. So in Grails 1 and 2, your Grails application was a Spring MVC app. It didn't look like one from a source code perspective, but that's what it was. Um, in Grails 3, your, uh, your Grails application is a Spring Boot app. And again, it doesn't look like a boot app from a source code perspective, but that, that's what it is. We're, we've built the framework on top of Spring, and there are lots of good reasons for that. Spring does all sorts of terrific stuff, and we wanted to make it easier to take advantage of all the stuff that Spring has to offer and add a bunch of capability on top of that. And, in, and, that's, uh, and Grails has been really successful at doing that. Um, but we get all the benefits that Spring has to offer, and there are lots of benefits that Spring has to offer. But in addition to that, we get, uh, we get all the cost associated with, uh, with Spring as well. And some of those costs have to do with uh, some of the reasons that Grails and Spring are not a terrific fit for building, uh, for building microservices. And, when, and we'll get into a, a little bit of those details. We're not going to get super deep, but uh, I will touch on some of that. So we had to make a decision about what to do um, to address the growing interest in building microservices, right? So one thing we could do is we could continue to evolve our current technology to be more and more compatible with the way people want to build applications today. So in this particular case, we could, we could uh, work on evolving the Grails framework to be more and more compatible with building microservices and address some of the challenges that, that Grails has related to that. Uh, to building those kinds of apps. Or we could go back to the drawing board and design a whole new thing from the ground up, specifically designed and optimized for building, um, uh, for building microservices. And that's what we did. Um, so it turned, that, that's what we decided to do. So we decided to um, uh, start completely from scratch, build a thing from the ground up, specifically designed and optimized uh, for, for building microservices, and that's that's what Micronaut um, that's what Micronaut is. That's what Micronaut became. So uh, fairly early in that process, one of the things we had to do was set out a list of goals that we wanted for the that we had for the framework. Um, so remember that the framework is being designed and optimized specifically for building microservices. And people will build monoliths with Micronaut, and that's fine. Uh, people will have success doing that. Just like you can build microservices with Grails, you can build monoliths with Micronaut. Um, but we're, we're designing and optimizing the framework specifically for building microservices. And that means as we're making design decisions, uh, if one solution might favor microservices but come at a cost to monoliths, or another solution might favor monoliths but come at a cost to microservices, 100% uh, of the time, as we're confronted with those kinds of decisions, we're favoring microservices. The framework is specifically being optimized for building those kinds of applications. So we decided to go uh, back to the drawing board, start from scratch, build a new framework designed and optimized for building microservices. And one of the things we had to do, or, 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 or one of the things we did, was come up with a list of goals or attributes that we wanted this framework to have. Um, and the list is long. This, this is a, a small subset. Um, but some of the attributes that we wanted the framework to have included really fast startup times and low memory footprints and small executable jar files. And these are all, th these are examples of attributes that affect microservices differently than they affect monolithic web apps. So think about um, memory footprint, right? So a, a small Grails application, a small one, you're probably going to allocate 500 meg of heap to the thing. Uh, a more robust Grails application, you're probably going to allocate a gig or two or maybe even more. Um, but something like that. We'll, we'll, we'll say a, a gigabyte of heap is a typical heap for a Grails app, we'll say, just for the sake of, of conversation here. Uh, for a monolith, maybe that's not that big of a deal. Um, in your development environment, maybe you don't even think about it. You just type Grails run app or Gradle W boot run, start the application up, and the fact that it might be taking uh, you know, 500 meg of, of heap or whatever it's, it's taking, maybe you don't even think much about it. It just happens and you go about your development business. Um, uh, and, but with a, with a microservice architecture, there's not just one of those things. There might be a bunch of those things. Maybe, maybe there are 20 microservices, and you want to start them all up concurrently in your development environment to, to see these things uh, interact with each other. Um, you're not going to start up. If you, if you had a, a set of applications that all took a, a, a couple gig of RAM, uh, 
um, you're not going to start up 20 or 30 of those concurrently on your laptop and have success doing that. There are a number of reasons that's not going to work, and one of them is you're going to run out of memory for all those processes. Um, in a microservice architecture, you might want to do that. And if we had really, really small memory footprints, it would be totally practical. So in, in Micronaut, for example, we have uh, the, a, a really small Micronaut app can run at about 10 megabytes of heap. Um, and depending on what your app's doing, you might have to allocate more than that. Uh, if you're allocating lots of objects, you've got to have a place to put them. But a, a, a typical mic Micronaut service might be uh, running in something like uh, uh, 16 megabytes of heap. Maybe less if you're really tuning things down, maybe a little bit more. But that's, th that's the kind of ballpark you're, you're starting with. So, so, so call it 12 or 16 meg of heap as opposed to a gig of heap, right? A whole different ballpark. So with, uh, with something like that, um, it's totally practical to start up three or four of these, or 10 of them, or however many you want to run on your development machine. And that's a benefit not only to your development environment, but also your production environment. Lots of folks building microservice architectures want to deploy these things to a cloud environment and configure these cloud environments to uh, dynamically scale based on real-time load. So maybe you're, you're sitting with uh, uh, four copies of the service running under normal circumstances. And then when load increases because your commercial is on television or whatever it is that causes load to, uh, to, to uh, spike in your system, that thing happens. And now instead of four, you want uh, 12 of them or, or more. You want these things to dynamically scale up. And in your cloud environment, your cost is directly associated with uh, how many instances you're running, how much memory you're allocating to each of those instances, how much processor is in each of those uh, uh, virtual machines. All that stuff affects your cost. So if you've got 20 services that you're allocating two gigabytes of heap to, that's going to cost potentially considerably more than 20 services that you're allocating 16 meg of heap for, right? So the small memory footprint, th those are examples of... Uh, scenarios that, that relate to, to microservices where you, the concern would be different for a monolith, right? For a monolith, if you've got one of these things running and it's taking up two gig of RAM, maybe you don't care so much about that. But if you've got a bunch of them running, then you start to recognize the cost associated with that. Uh, startup time uh, is uh, similar in, in a number of ways. Um, so startup time for a Grails application depends on a number of factors, um, but startup, call a typical startup time something like 20 seconds. And if the app is doing a whole lot at application startup time, maybe 30 seconds. And if the app is poorly written, maybe it's, it's going to be even longer than that. Um, but a 30-second startup time isn't uh, uh, totally crazy and out of the ballpark. That's a somewhat typical startup time for a Grails application. For a monolith that's going to be running maybe for months and months and months at a time, maybe you don't care so much about that. Um, but for microservices where you want to spin these things up in real time, uh, uh, in response to um, uh, load conditions changing, uh, you, maybe you want to start up a new instance of this service right now. You don't want to start it at midnight. You don't want to start it in two minutes. You want it to start right now. Um, start up in maybe less than a second. So, and with uh, Micronaut services, sub-second startup time isn't out of the question. A lot of Micronaut services do start in less than a second. A typical startup time might be a second, a little bit more, but something in that neighborhood. Call it one second, not 30 seconds. So again, that's an attribute that affects microservices in ways that uh, are different than how that same attribute might affect um, monoliths. So we, we, we came up with a list of goals. We wanted to have really fast startup time, small memory footprints, minimal dependencies, small executable jar files, and the list is long, right? So we come up with a list of goals. And one of the next things we had to do was relate that list of goals to our current technology and make decision and, and let that um, understanding of, of how these goals relate to our current technology, let that affect our decisions about how to move forward, how to satisfy these goals. So we had to go down this list of goals and, and ask questions like, why can't I start a Grails application up in 700 milliseconds? And why can't I run a Grails application in 10 megabytes of heap? And all the way down the list. What is it about our current technology that keeps us from, uh, from satisfying these goals that we've got? And um, uh, for all of the things on the list, there are different combinations of factors that keep us from satisfying those goals. Um, but a lot of it has to do with the way that the Spring Framework works. Um, so I said that, that Grails is built on top of Spring, and uh, for good reasons, Grails is built on top of Spring. Spring offers this really, really great programming model. Um, and a good example, an easy one to think about, is Spring's transaction management. 
So in a Spring application and in a Grails application, because a Grails application is a Spring application, you can author a class um, that's gonna be a, a bean in the application context and annotate that class with at transactional. And when you do that, a bunch of valuable behavior gets added to that class. Um, so if you annotate a class with at transactional, when you make calls to methods in that class, a transaction is automatically started, then your code executes, then the transaction is committed. If an exception is thrown, the transaction gets rolled back. Um, th there's more to it than that, but uh, th that's enough of a, a summary to describe the programming model. And that is, Spring allows you to declaratively express something like, I want this class to be transactional, or I want this class to participate in my caching mechanism. And that programming model is awesome. That means I don't, as an application developer, I don't have to write all the transaction management code myself. I can write the transaction management code when I want to do lower level, when I want to manage that stuff on my own, but for the common use patterns, um, the framework provides support such that I don't have to, to do the transaction management. I just declaratively express by way of an annotation that I want this thing to be transactional and then a bunch of uh, a great behavior comes along because of that. That's the programming model, that's the, the good part of, uh, of these frameworks. Uh, the, the less good part of, how all that, uh, of that is how it works. Um, and there's a lot to this, but uh, we'll, we'll, uh, in short, the, the way that Spring does a lot of that sort of thing, the way it does caching and transaction management and other, other capabilities that are really valuable that the framework has to offer, is by way of dynamic proxies and uh, uh, heavy use of runtime reflection. So Spring has to look through all of the beans in the context and reflect on all those classes and discover things about the classes, like discover where is the transaction, uh, uh, transactional annotation used and what are the attributes specified when the annotation is used? Where is the cacheable annotation used? All that, so, and a lot of that is done by way of a runtime reflection and then the result, or one of the things that happens after doing that runtime reflection is dynamic proxies are created which impose the behavior that, that you want, like, like the caching behavior or the transaction management behavior. Um, so the programming model is, is the awesome part, but there's a cost associated with the way that's implemented, and that cost affects things like memory consumption and uh, startup time and, and other aspects of your application. So uh, the programming model is the good part, right? That's what we love, the, the idea that you can annotate a class with transactional and now you, there's a bunch of logic that you don't have to write. That programming model is great. And we wanted to embrace that programming model. We didn't want to introduce a whole new way to do things like that. We wanted to embrace that programming model. But just like it was, uh, w it was easy to recognize that there had to be a better way 10 years ago um, when we started the Grails framework, um, we had a, a similar experience when confronting some of these challenges. Uh, there ought to be a way to um, embrace this programming model without all the same uh, uh, costs that we get in, uh, with, with Grails and Spring for, in order to, uh, to use that programming model. So we came up with a list of goals, developed an understanding of what about our current technology keeps us from satisfying those goals, and then set out to, uh, to build the Micronaut framework. Um, so development on Micronaut started uh, about a year and a half ago. Uh, the later part of 2017 is when development started. Um, last year, uh, so 2018, at this conference is when we very first um, really officially announced Micronaut and open sourced it. So at great 2018 is when we open, uh, is when we open sourced Micronaut and released 1.0 Milestone 1. That was the first time anyone outside of object computing had seen the technology. We had demoed some stuff before that, but that, that was the first time we, we released the software. It was great Conf EU uh, last year. Um, and uh, uh, a few months after that, so I think in October this past year is when we released uh, 1.0. So we worked on it uh, almost a year uh, before releasing 1.0 and have been working diligently on it since releasing 1.0 and now we're up to 1.1.2 uh, I think is the most recent release. So um, we started building Micronaut about a year and a half ago. The framework has been designed and optimized specifically for building microservices, and we see lots of um, sort of evidence of that in the, the way that the framework works. The runtime in Micronaut is, uh, is based on Netty, and uh, there are a number of reasons that we chose to build the runtime on Netty. Netty's really, really fast, it's really lightweight, it's got a bunch of great reactive capabilities in it. Um, there, there, are a bunch of, there, there are a number of reasons that we built the runtime on top of Netty. But one of the things that's very different about Micronaut's 
uh, relationship to the runtime versus, uh, say, Grails' relationship to its runtime is the only way to run a Grails application, and th there are no exceptions to this, and there have never been an exception to this, the only way to run a Grails application is in a servlet container. It's, it's the only way to run a Grails app. So you create a WAR file and drop it into Tomcat or whatever server container you like, and that's how you deploy Grails apps. Um, we have support for building an executable jar file, um, but in that executable jar file is an embeddable Tomcat. So when you run the jar file, uh, a servlet container is being started up. That's the only way to run a Grails application, is in a servlet container. Um, we didn't want that same kind of uh, relationship between Micronaut and its runtime. So what we've done with Micronaut is we've kept the runtime separate from the rest of the framework. So the runtime that we've provided right now is based on Netty, but that part of, of the framework is, has been kept separate from all the other functionality that you more directly interact with, and we're in a position to build other runtimes. So we'll likely build a servlet-based runtime. We could build, um, uh, we can build other runtimes for Micronaut uh, because from the very beginning we, we've kept uh, most of the capability in the frameworks separate from the runtime, and so we're in, we're in a great position with respect to that. Micronaut is not, uh, it's not just one thing, it's really a portfolio of, uh, of components and capabilities. And in that portfolio, uh, among the things in that portfolio are an aspect-oriented programming engine, and a dependency injection container, um, an HTTP client. There, there's a bunch of interesting components that make up uh, what, what we would just call Micronaut as a whole. Um, the AOP engine and the DI container in particular are interesting components to talk about. Um, I'll talk a little bit about the DI container in particular. So DI, of course, is dependency injection. Inside of Micronaut is a dependency injection container um, with some really interesting attributes. Um, one thing that uh, uh, we can say about the DI container is it's fully compliant with JSR 330, which is the dependency injection um, specification for the, for the JVM. Um, so Micronaut's DI container is fully compliant with the spec. It passes the full TCK. It's, it's a fully robust dependency injection container. And it can be used separate from the rest of Micronaut. So if you were building a Java app that's not, not, not otherwise a Micronaut app, you're just building a Java app and you wanted a dependency injection container, uh, it's easy to use Micronaut's DI container uh, outside of the, the rest of Micronaut. You can use the DI container by itself. Uh, the DI container has some really interesting um, characteristics to it that uh, many of them which relate to uh, the fact that the whole DI container is being configured at compile time, which is a fundamental difference between how um, uh, other DI containers like Spring work. Um, Micronaut's DI container has no dependence at all on reflection. Um, so we configure the whole container at compile time. So when you annotate a class with at singleton or at controller or you use any of the Micronaut annotations or the JSR 330 annotations, we have compile time annotation processors in Micronaut that recognize those annotations. And at compile time, we generate all the instructions to configure the DI container at runtime. So, so the instructions are all being created at compile time, which means at runtime, we don't have to do any runtime reflection. Um, to do things like uh, discover the fact that an annotation is there, or discover that a constructor exists that we need to pass something into, or discover setter methods that the DI container has to call. All that is recognized at compile time, which makes the DI container very, very fast and makes it um, uh, lowers what would, uh, the, the memory requirements that the thing has. Because one of the costs of doing all this reflection is not only the cost of doing the reflection itself, but while that reflection is happening, what the framework is doing is building up this model that describes what you've expressed in your annotations and describes all the relationships between your beans. And that model that describes all these relationships um, takes up memory. Um, so not only are you paying the runtime cost for doing all the reflection, the, the result of doing the reflection is this, this model is being built up that represents the stuff that needs to happen inside of your DI container. With our DI container that's all configured at compile time, we've done away with both those. We're not paying the runtime, runtime reflection cost, and we're not building up this model at runtime that is the result of that reflection that we're not doing, right? So there are a number of interesting attributes of the DI container. I'm not going to go any deeper into the tech stuff there uh, now. I'm really happy to talk about any of that. If you've got questions, just seek me out um, uh, later in the day, and we can go as deep into the DI container as you like. But the dependency injection container in Micronaut is, is just awesome. Um, there, there's lots of great things to say about it.
Um, so to put some numbers on some of those goals I talked about earlier, um, so you can run, uh, you can create a, a Micronaut executable jar file that for a Hello World app that's as small as about eight megabytes. So I'm talking about the jar size. Uh, and of course, the more code you have in your project, the bigger that's going to get because all your class files are in that jar file. But that size there represents kind of the tax that the framework is in imposing on your app. And that, that's, that's pretty tiny. Um, the minimum, minimum memory requirements, you can run a Micronaut service in as little as 10 megabytes of heap. Um, you're probably going to allocate a little bit more than that if your app is, is doing much, but not a whole lot more. You're not going to allocate 500 meg or even 100 meg. Um, you're going to have small processes that might be, so 16 meg might be a totally reasonable amount of, of heap for most of your Micronaut services. So the framework is not imposing a lot of um, uh, a sort of a tax in the form of memory requirements on your application. Uh, we get startup times that are around a second, uh, sometimes faster than a second, sometimes a little bit more, but uh, in that ballpark. So two seconds is a long time to start up a, a Micronaut service. Uh, so something's probably wrong. Um, if, uh, it, certainly if, if your startup time is multiple seconds. Uh, and as I said, sub-second is a, a, a common uh, thing you'll see in a lot of Micronaut services. And the lack of reflection is, uh, is a significant factor there. Once we got rid of all the runtime reflection in order to initialize the DI container, uh, startup time dropped off really, really quickly. And then there was still a bunch of other stuff that we did to optimize that further. But getting rid of reflection wa was an important part of that. And the way that we got rid of reflection is by moving that work to compile time. And with Java, the way that Micronaut does that is with uh, Java um, compile time annotation processors. Um, Micronaut is a polyglot framework. We support multiple languages. So we support Java, Groovy, and Kotlin. Uh, with Java, we use annotation processors. For Kotlin, we use CAPT, which is the Kotlin annotation processing thing, and that kind of piggybacks on the Java annotation processors. And the, uh, for Groovy classes, we use AST transformations, which are kind of like, um, uh, they're, uh, it's, it's a, uh, sort of a compiler extension. Groovy allows you to do lots of interesting things at compile time uh, by way of AST transformations, and uh, that's how we're, we're dealing with annotations in Micronaut for Groovy source code. Um, it's uh, uh, interesting to note that while we're using AST transformations in Micronaut, um, we're using them in a way that's very different than the way we use them in the Grails framework. Those of you, so everyone here said you were familiar with Grails. So in a controller, uh, or, or a domain class is a good example. So in a domain class, uh, the framework adds a bunch of capability to your domain classes, right? There's a method on your domain classes called save, and there's a method on your domain classes called list, and there are a bunch of GORM-related methods that we add to your domain classes. In controllers, uh, we add things like the request property and the session property and the render method and the respond method. All that capability that's added to your Grails artifacts, uh, that's all done by way of uh, AST transformations, or AST transformations are involved in making that happen. And in all of those cases, so for Grails controllers, domain classes, services, the framework is changing your classes at compile time by way of AST transformations. We're adding stuff to your classes. In Micronaut, we're not doing that. Even though we're using AST transformations for Groovy, we're not modifying your classes. Instead, we're creating other classes that you never directly interact with, and your code is your code. Um, so, so that's an important distinction between um, the way some of this works in Micronaut and the way some of this works in Grails. Even though we're using AST transformations in both places, we're using them in very different ways. In Grails, we use AST transformations to change your classes. In Micronaut, we're using AST transformations to generate new classes based on what we see in your classes. And then for Java and Kotlin, AST transformations aren't part of the story at all. Right? So uh, th those AST transformations and annotation processes are how we got rid of all the, the runtime reflection in, uh, in Micronaut. And that's another example of this identify, innovate, and iterate thing. So we identified an issue, right? To, in order to get this, this really great programming model, we're paying this cost that has to do with reflection and dynamic proxies and so forth. So we created some new technology to uh, change the way that uh, that could work, and that's, uh, uh, that is an, it has enabled a bunch of uh, the, the really compelling characteristics that, that Micronaut has to, ha has to offer. One of the things that Micronaut is, is a framework for building REST services, right? That'd be a really, really simple way to think about what Micronaut is, but it's really a lot more than that. Um, one of the things that's really interesting about Micronaut is, uh, one of the things it does is it makes it very, very easy to take advantage 
of these really robust um, and sometimes really sophisticated and sometimes complicated um, cloud services. So we've got built, built-in support in, in the framework. Uh, we've got built-in support for things like service discovery using console or Eureka or Route 53 or Kubernetes. Uh, we've got built-in support for distributed config. So if you want to uh, put your configuration stuff in Amazon's uh, parameter store, you can do that. And Micronaut knows how to retrieve those values and make those values part of your application configuration. Uh, we've got some really interesting and compelling uh, client-side load balancing capabilities in our HTTP client. We've got support for serverless computing um, with uh, AWS Lambdas, and uh, you, you can deploy Micronaut services to Google Cloud Run, Google's new um, recently announced um, serverless computing platform. It's, it's almost trivial to publish Micronaut services to, to Google Cloud Run. So my, one of the things Micronaut is, is it's a set of tools and, and uh, libraries that makes it very, very easy to take advantage of these, uh, these cloud services. This tweet I found interesting uh, in part because of the, uh, the, the, the timing. This tweet was released, uh, I think this tweet was published before we released 1.0. But this person is mentioning that how great it is and how easy it was to get started with Micronaut to connect his services to Kafka and Console and Zipkin and MongoDB and JPA. Uh, one of the reasons I found this, this tweet interesting is he's recognizing one of the important things that Micronaut is, and that is it's making it very, very easy to integrate with all of these services, right? So he listed a few there. There are, there are a bunch more that Micronaut's great, got great support for. That's one of the important parts of uh, the, the uh, sort of sets of value that Micronaut has to offer. And that is we're making it very, very easy to deploy services to a cloud environment, um, to take advantage of these, this rich suite of services that the cloud providers um, uh, provide. That's an important part of uh, why Micronaut is, uh, is as valuable and compelling as it is. So when we started talking to people about Micronaut a year ago, um, we started getting uh, the same question we got about the Grails framework a decade ago, and that was, do we, do we really need another one of these things? Uh, every, everyone and their brother is creating a new HTTP server kind of contraption. Do we need another one of those? And the answer is we d don't need just another HTTP server, um, but Micronaut is not just another HTTP server. In fact, it's not an HTTP server. We needed one of those, and that's what we, we piggybacked on, on top of Netty. But Micronaut is not just another HTTP server. It's not just another REST framework. It's a, a, a really robust framework that is a REST framework. It's got some really cool JSON stuff in it. We've got this really great DI container. The list is long, all these specific things that, that make up Micronaut and make it compelling. But Micronaut is, is more than just this developer framework for publishing REST services. It's this uh, technology that makes it very, very easy to build, deploy, and manage uh, microservice architectures, including all the great integrations that we've got with the uh, uh, services offered by the cloud providers. So at, at Object Computing, the company behind all this technology, um, we're, a, uh, we're a Google partner, we're an Amazon partner, we've got really great integrations with, uh, uh, with uh, both of those environments, and we'll continue to evolve and, uh, and innovate in both those, uh, both those areas. We've got some really great Google stuff already, but we've got some really great Google stuff that we'll be rolling out uh, moving forward, and the same with our Amazon support. Uh, there's already a really, really impressive stuff in Micronaut and, uh, and more coming. Um, so Micronaut is not just another HTTP server. Um, and finally, uh, so I mentioned that last year at this conference is when we really first officially announced, uh, announced Micronaut and open sourced it, and there was tremendous uh, response from the community and, and um, lots of great things have happened since then. But we were, were really excited to have been able to announce Micronaut at, uh, at, at this particular event last year. We've got another uh, really, really big announcement to make um, that unfortunately I can't make uh, today. Uh, we're not exactly ready yet, um, but uh, mark your calendars on July 18th. We've got something really, really, really super exciting that uh, most of the folks, um, uh, at, um, uh, that most of you are going to be interested in, uh, in hearing about. So make a note on your calendar, July 18th. Uh, between now and then, we will be publishing uh, information about how to sign up for, uh, there'll be an online event, it'll be uh, free of course, um, and uh, so I'm not going to go any deeper into the details there other than to uh, just maybe wet your whistle and, and make you curious, but 
it's really, really big news. Uh, we're really excited about what we're going to be able to announce in uh, just a couple of months. Um, so look for that. Uh, some resources, really, if you just start at micronaut.io, you can navigate to all the other points of interest. Um, so I encourage you to do that. And as I said, I'll be here uh, the rest of the conference, and I'm happy to talk to folks about Micronaut Grails or anything that object computing uh, does. But uh, if you have any specific questions right now, we've got just a couple of minutes. Uh, are there any questions about Micronaut um, that, or anything else that I might be able to help you with right now, other than can you tell me more about this? Uh, so the answer's going to be no. No questions? Yes, sir. Yeah, so the question is, uh, uh, or the comment was, we've got uh, great support for Google and Amazon. What about OpenShift? Um, so we've uh, looked at some of the OpenShift stuff. Nothing specific and, uh, and interesting has been developed yet, but I uh, wouldn't rule that out. Um, there are other platforms that uh, we'll be evaluating as well, but th there's nothing specific uh, around OpenShift right now. But that's not, um, th that really doesn't mean anything other than we haven't done that yet. Yes, sir. Um, I keep hearing in the slides and the talks about how um, like uh, Micronaut can be used for Android development. So like I have two questions: A, how, and B, is anybody actually doing this on production? Uh, yeah. So the comment is uh, so um, he mentioned that he's seen some mention of using Micronaut on Android. Uh, so the question is how, and the second part: Well, is anyone doing this in production? So, um, the, so you can, in fact, use Micronaut uh, on Android uh, to build Android apps. So I have uh, some native apps running on here. Uh, on, this is an Android phone, of course, um, that are using Micronaut. Uh, so it turns out it, it's really easy to take advantage of a number of Micronaut components um, in an environment like that. So, for example, what, what, I, what I've built are uh, some demos that use Micronaut for an Android app and uh, take advantage of our DI container for wiring together the uh, 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 Android components. And uh, maybe the more interesting part is I'm using Micronaut's HTTP client. There's a bunch of really, really cool stuff about our HTTP client. Uh, I wish we could just go deep into that right now. Um, but a common thing that you might want to do on a mobile app is have a, a local native app um, communicating with a backend service uh, maybe over REST. So on the phone, I've got the DI container running. The DI container takes care of creating and initializing and doing all the cool stuff that the HTTP client does. And now we've made it really, really easy to build an app for, uh, that'll run locally on the Android device that acts as a client for communicating with REST services. In, uh, so uh, later this week, so Thursday and Friday of this week, we've got a two-day Micronaut training event that we're doing immediately following the, uh, the conference. And uh, that event is, uh, uh, the title is uh, Micronaut from IoT to GCP. And the idea there is we're going to learn to program uh, small IoT devices, these little Raspberry Pi devices that uh, all the students get to keep the hardware and there's a really cool battery and, and there's a whole thing. Um, but we're going to program uh, Raspberry Pis. We're going to see what it takes to deploy Micronaut services to GCP. Um, so from sort of small to big, these small devices out to the, to the cloud and get them connected. And while we're not going to, the Android stuff is not really formally part of the class, uh, uh, some of that will be demonstrated. Uh, separate from what we're doing in the class uh, this week is uh, we'll be publishing um, some guides around how to use Micronaut for Android. Um, and we've got a series of videos um, that uh, I don't know how far out we are. It might be a couple of months from before we can start publishing that series of videos. But there'll be a series of videos, including, uh, not dedicated to Android, but in that sort of library that, that we're producing and we'll publish, uh, a piece of that is Micronaut for Android. So um, uh, more to come in terms of examples and documentation, guides and videos and so forth. But um, sort of the starting point is absolutely you can use Micronaut on Android. Uh, Micronaut is really just a, a set of libraries, a set of jar files. And you can bring those jar files into an Android app like you can bring them into any uh, a JVM app, and it all works really, really well. Once we can art, sort of articulate the possibilities and publish uh, examples and all that, I think folks are going to be excited about using Micronaut on Android. Uh, so that's an area that I've been uh, uh, pressing into myself in, uh, in the, the last uh, a couple of months, and I'm excited to hopefully get some of that stuff published soon so people can recognize how great of a fit that is. Any other questions? Right here. 
Yeah, the question is, will we still be supporting Grails, or is Micronaut a replacement for Grails? Is that correct? Um, so the answer to the first one is yes, and the answer to the second one is no. Absolutely, we are going to continue supporting Grails. We're investing heavily in Grails. Uh, we're about to release Grails 4. That was no small effort. It took a whole lot of work to get uh, Grails 4 to, to where it is, and we're almost ready to uh, ship the thing. One of the exciting things about Grails 4 is we're integrating Micronaut into Grails. So in Grails 4, the parent application context is Micronaut, and then we're using Spring for the, the child context. Um, so that means we're going to be able to take advantage of all the benefits that Micronaut has to offer without walking away from everything that the Spring framework has to offer. So one of the things that the Spring framework has to offer is this really rich ecosystem that's evolved over the last 15 years or however long Spring's been around. And lots of folks want to take advantage of that in the context of a Grails app. In Grails 4, you're going to be able to do that while still taking advantage, in addition to that, taking advantage of all the stuff that the Micronaut has to offer. As we've done that, one of the things we've done is refactored Grails itself. Um, so, so Grails uses Spring all over the place in the framework, separate from your application using Spring, the framework itself. Uh, relies heavily on the DI container and configuring the, the framework as a bunch of beans that are wired together. Um, and in Grails 4, a lot of that has been refactored. So instead of those, the, the internals being spring beans, we're able to use Micronaut for a lot of that. And that has uh, enabled uh, significant performance uh, gains in uh, Grails 4. So startup time is much, much lower for a Grails 4 app than uh, say a Grails 2 or 3 app. Um, uh, so integrating Micronaut into Grails is, is enabling us to, to make uh, significant strides with Grails. But Micronaut is not a replacement for Grails, for sure. Uh, so Micronaut is, uh, is specifically targeted for building uh, microservices. Grails is still a really great fit for scenarios like if you want to build a monolithic web app, uh, if you want to do server-side HTML generation, if you want to integrate with the Spring ecosystem. There are still good reasons, and there will be for a long time, there'll be good reasons for folks to continue to build application, certain applications with Grails and build other applications with Micronaut. Um, but uh, there's no one clarity from our perspective at all. Micronaut is definitely not a replacement for Grails. There are two different technologies that are targeting two different kinds of applications. And like I said at the very beginning, when you're building microservices with a framework like Grails, um, it can be done, but compromises are being made. And a big part of the reason that we created Micronaut was to uh, eliminate that, right? So you can build microservices with a technology that's optimized specifically for that kind of thing. And uh, so that's why Micronaut exists, not to replace uh, the Grails framework. We're still heavily invested in Grails and will be for a long time. Uh, Grails 4 is about to ship and we've uh, got an active roadmap for what's to follow. But I'm glad you asked that. Any other questions? Go ahead. Um, how, how does the, uh, the uh, Micronaut's DI container uh, compare to uh, uh, DI container, which is also a compiled type only DI container? Yeah, the question is how does Micronaut's DI container compare with Dagger, which is also a compiled time DI container? So, one thing I could say is that Micronaut's DI container is better in every way. Uh, but, uh, <laughs> I, I expect that that's probably not uh, entirely, uh, entirely accurate. Um, so there, there, I, I don't have anything specific I could say about how Micronaut relates to, uh, to Dagger, uh, but along those lines, uh, I think you and I talked about this yesterday a little bit, um, along those lines, one of the things that we're working on right now is a set of uh, reports and metrics and some numbers and some example apps and so forth that are going to help folks recognize how Micronaut relates to um, some non-Micronaut options. So uh, uh, how does a Micronaut service relate to a Spring Boot service that's doing the same kind of thing? And using best practices in both, in both examples, uh, we're creating a set of projects where you'll be able to run these things side by side and validate for yourself, rather than us tell you things like it's 10 times faster, whatever we might tell you, uh, that, that will all be documented and, and well understood. Uh, rather than you having to take our word for it, we want to create a suite of projects where you can validate these things yourself. So you'll be able to, to see how does performance, uh, how does Micronaut performance relate to uh, a boot app that's doing the same sort of thing? Um, how does a Micronaut app, uh, how does performance relate to if you were doing lower level, uh, just using Netty directly? And not only how does performance relate, but what does it look like from the developer's perspective? How much simpler is it with Micronaut versus if you were just doing all the low level stuff yourself? 
Um, so we're working on a suite of um, uh, projects and reports that will help folks understand how Micronaut relates to some other options out there. Um, I ha hadn't thought about relating the DI container to, uh, to Dagger, but uh, it's, uh, uh, it's uh, a good suggestion. I think we'll give that some thought and maybe we'll include that in the, uh, the portfolio of stuff that we're creating to represent metrics and help folks relate Micronaut to, to some other, uh, other options. It's a good idea, I think. Might have time for one more question if there is one. No? Very good. Well, thank you all very much for your time. Uh, please come and uh, see any of us at the object computing table if you have questions or comments about uh, Micronaut Grails or OCI. Um, I hope you all enjoy the rest of the conference and thank you for your time. Do you have anything to do? Thank you very much. Uh, we are a little bit uh, ahead of schedule, but uh, right now there's a break and uh, the next session starts at 9.55. In this auditorium, we have a JEP3 update by Marcin Erdmann. In um, auditorium two, security in Micronaut with uh, Sergio. In auditorium three, there's extending Spock into the future with Leonard. And in uh, the workshop, there's a guide uh, to uh, developer-friendly DSLs with Vladimir Orani. So um, mingle and be ready at uh, 9.55.